Good evening and a particularly big welcome to our audience here in Bristol and to our panel, the Secretary of State for International Development, Justin Greening, the Shadow Home Office Minister for Labour, Stella Creasy, the founder of Cobra Beer and a crossbench member of the House of Lords, Lord Billy Moria, the author and professor of contemporary thought at Brunel University, Will Self, and the columnist of the Mail on Sunday, Peter Hitchens. Your, your morning paper may have said, and if you read the Times newspaper, would indeed have said that James Harding, the editor of the Times, was going to be on the panel tonight. But sadly, he announced today that he was resigning from the editorship, and he rang me and said, unfortunately, he couldn't, therefore, come on the panel. We hope to have him back in some other equally distinguished guise some other day. So let's go on to our first question. Um, and I do have just to remind viewers, because I was asked it tonight by our audience here, our panel here do not know the questions that are going to be put to them. Do you? Any of you? No. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first question comes from Warren Birch, please. Is the large number of Tory MPs opposing gay marriage symptomatic of a party out of touch with contemporary society? The large number of Tory MPs opposing gay marriage proposed and, of course, endorsed by the Prime Minister. Uh, Will Self? I'm not particularly out of touch. I think the figures are about 55-45 on the marriage issue, 55 in favour, 45 against. Uh, by and large, people are in favour of civil partnerships, but there seems to be this view abroad that marriage is only made of a man and a woman, whatever they may be, uh, and that you can't get married if you're of the same sex. Uh, and a lot of people seem to, to, to go back to particularly, I think, the, the Gospel according to Mark and one of the other Gospels in order to, uh, you know, establish this fact that it has to be a man and a woman. But it's interesting that these people, and some of them are Tory MPs, seem to want to literally interpret this particular bit of Scripture. But there are other bits of uh, Scripture that they're quite happy to disregard, like the creation of the earth in seven days and actually resting on the seven Day, that would be good. Uh, they're perpetually working. So I rather mistrust this surge in biblical literalism that seems to grip the uh, anti-gay marriage lobby. I mean, if you're asking my personal opinion, uh, I think just about anybody should be allowed to get married to anybody else. But there you go. That's... Justin Greening. Well, I very much agree with Will. It's something that I've certainly thought a lot with, about. With the questioner or with Will? Uh, with, with Will's answer, I think that um, there is a real breadth of opinion both in the Conservative Party, but I think generally across Parliament, and there'll be a free vote on it, is something that I've had to consider. Um, and from my perspective, I, I think, as Will does, I, I think if people want to get married, I think they should be allowed to get on and do that. I think as long as we've got the right uh, protections in place for churches that don't want to um, allow gay marriage, I think that's fine. And I think that then respects everybody's right to, to get on with their life the way, the way that they want to. Why should um, gay couples be entitled to either a civil partnership or marriage, whereas heterosexual couples are only entitled to get married, not to have a civil partnership? I don't think there's a lot of uh, demand. Certainly, I've never had a constituent um, who's heterosexual ask me why they can't uh, have a civil partnership with their partner. So I don't think there's an awful lot of demand for civil partnerships uh, for heterosexual couples. Uh, I think the question is whether we're willing to uh, give, give gay people equal rights in terms of being able to get married. And I, I just think, having spent a lot of time thinking about it, that it's the right thing to do. And, and I just don't think that we should stand in the way of two people who want to make a, a lifetime commitment to one another. I think as long as we're clear that we don't force churches and people of faith who don't feel comfortable with that to have their own churches having to do marriages, then okay. I, think you, I think you get everybody able, to, able to, to have their own rights to live their life the, how they the, want the to. Question, the question was about the 100 or so Tory MPs who oppose it and whether this is symptomatic of a party out of touch. I mean, you've got the Prime Minister going for it, but a large number of backbenchers of his backbenchers against. I, I very much respect their opinion. I just reached the conclusion that I disagree with it. Uh, aren't they it's... just um, homophobic, these 100 MPs? That's what it looks like to me. They just don't like gay people. 
no, it's sort of, you know, it's the principle of Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is they don't like gay people. I mean, get over it, you know, as, <laughs> as a Matt Lucas might say. The, the woman up there on, on, the, on the back, on the left, yes. Yeah, I think it's actually a travesty that they've um, tried to kind of enact this liberalising, accepting policy uh, on the surface, but then they've announced that within the Church of England and the Church of Wales, it's illegal to force these churches to enact a ceremony. And I think that, yeah, that's just basically them creating a loophole to kind of continue pandering to the homophobic, prejudiced sections of the people that are within that party and that, that support that party. Yeah, and I think that that's a travesty in, in our day and age in a liberal, progressive, democratic society. It's going to be illegal for the Church of England to yeah. perform... A, a... Peter Hitchens. Oh, well, if you want to know why the Conservative Party is out of touch with the people who once were Conservatives and would like to vote for it, and the reason why the Conservative Party is dying on its feet and has almost no members. It's nothing to do with this. It's because the Conservative Party is in favour of the European Union. The Conservative Party is against punishing criminals. The Conservative Party is in favour of the failed comprehensive experiment in education. The Conservative Party is in favour of mass immigration. That's why the Conservative Party is out of touch. The issue of, of same-sex marriage is so immensely trivial and unimportant. It's only raised as a wind-up to draw poor, silly old conservatives out of their caves so that they can be made to look like bigots and fools and howled at and jeered at as homophobes by people Why would like, the Prime Minister want like, to do that? Why would he want to do that? Because he hates his party. <laughs> uh, he, hates, he, hates most of the, he hates most of the members of it. Uh, and he, 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 and he wants to drag he want, them down he wants to defeat. To, he, wants to, he, he loves to appeal to the Guardian newspaper and the BBC by bashing his own party and having rows with it. And that, that's the sole purpose of this. I, I don't imagine he cares in the slightest about the issue, but uh, maybe he does, but I don't see, he doesn't care about anything else or believe in anything else, so it would be a change if he did. <laughs> the, 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 Mr. Slippery behaves like this. He, he just... He, he just tries to wind up what's left of his own party because he thinks that's, the, that's his only future, to make right. the people, to make the, 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 the liberal bigots who, who genu genuinely hate and loathe people with conservative moral opinions uh, and, and have no time for them at all and misrepresent them and lie about them, to make them think he's a good thing. That's his purpose. OK. Um, Justin Greening is seething with... Rage and wants to come to the Good. defense of her leader here on my right. So I'll let you briefly do that before I. I think I think what David Cameron's trying to do represents a broad strand of what the Conservative Party is about today. And just to come back to your point about the Church of England and Wales, the reason uh, that there's got to be a, a law in place is because at the moment uh, the Church of England and Wales does not want to allow uh, same-sex marriages and. Because of the way in which they're set up within our country, we therefore have to put that into law. But if they did want to allow it, then we would, of course, be quite happy to change the law for them to do that. So I think what we're trying to do is make sure that every religious organisation has the ability to yeah. make its own choice right. about whether it wants to allow same-sex marriages they're or the not. They're the established church. I mean, they are the established church. Their bishops sit in, in Parliament. And, you and, know, they, and they should have the, they should no, have they the should choice as well as any other... Established it's, it's an incredibly ironic situation, isn't it, that all these people who claim that they're liberals, who claim that they care about conservatism, when it comes to something like this, which is one of the most traditional conservative with a small c things within our society, to make a commitment to somebody for life, they don't want it. It seems like people want to be a kind of small state liberal in the treasury, but a big state liberal in the bedroom, telling people what kind of relationship they want to have. Um, you know, I think that everyone in my community who wants to make a commitment to each other, a really serious, loving commitment, should be able to do so. I don't think it should be up to the state to decide how they do that. I think we should let religious organisations do it. But can I just say, Justine, it is disappointing, and I speak as a member of the Church of England, to see the legislation cast in this way, because actually there is a precedent about how the church dealt with priests who did not want to remarry people who were divorced, about making sure they were not required to do so, rather than explicitly banning it. Now, I respect that the Church of England is in this place at the moment, but I hope at some point we come to a different place. And I think it would be sad if that were to happen in the next 10 to 15 years, if we'd have to wait to legislation to make that happen. I just think the state should back out of this and let people who want to get married get married and show their love for each other equally, without it being about gender, with making it about love and commitment. Okay. 
I was going to say, isn't the issue less about 100 or so Tory MPs and more about a church that um, won't let gay people get married and won't let women be bishops? Seems. <laughs> Peter, I'm hanging on. Sorry, yeah, no, yeah, hang on for a bit longer. Karen Billamoria. We've had civil partnerships now for some time, and that seems to be working really well. And they have not been allowed to call themselves married. Well, to me, that's semantics. They are married for all practical purposes. They made that commitment. And now, if we want gay marriages, same sex marriages in religious establishments, if religious institutions and establishments want to do that, we should allow them to do that. But what we should never do is force anyone to do that if they don't want to. And the people that are objecting to this, not because they're homophobic, quite often it's because of their own religious beliefs. And what I love about this country is we're such an open country. We don't tolerate other religions. We celebrate the multicultural, secular society. Is, is your religion. church the Zoroastrian church and in favor of gay marriage? It is not about my church, your church. If somebody, if, 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 some, it, if, if somebody does not want to, if a religion doesn't want to allow it, for whatever reason, we should not force it. What, That's what? a sort of open country that yeah. we are. And, and, and what is the position of the Zoroastrian church on the issue? The Zoroastrian church, on the whole, uh, is, is, is a very liberal church. I don't know about where they would stand on this, but again, I would never force them to do anything like we wouldn't force any religion to do anything. Okay, you, sir, uh, in the fourth, third row there. Um, well, I don't trust uh, Miss Greening or Mr Cameron when they give assurances that those churches that don't wish to be involved in this won't have to be. I think that, that, that that's either naive at best or disingenuous at worst. In, in what way? You think they'll find well, themselves I think, up against I, the law? I suspect that there is absolutely no way that the European Court of Human Rights will stand for a situation if... Um, marriage is redefined, whereby a religious institution is prepared to offer marriage to one eligible section of society, i.e. straight couples, but not another. I think that the European Court of Human Rights will have absolutely no truck with that. And your view on the issue of gay marriage? Um, In favour or against? I believe, with the greatest of respect to homosexual couples, that uh, same-sex marriage is ontologically impossible. Okay. I think that. I think <laughs> ontologically that, impossible. You mean you don't think it's real? I don't. <laughs> I don't think that it can exist by its very nature. So, for example, I don't believe that it was interesting what you said, Will, in your in the very start of your answer, actually, that you would be happy for virtually anyone to marry virtually anyone else. Well, just in the same way that I don't... And the natural extrapolation of that is that we could arrive at a situation where very close relatives no, can marry each not. other. Or... Sorry, it's not. It's not at all, mm. sir. I, that, it's a complete misnomer to suggest that somehow there's an equivalence. We're talking about two people making a commitment to each other, making a loving commitment to each other. That's what marriage should be about. That's what my church right, teaches yeah. me marriage should be about, first and foremost. It's that love and commitment. It's not about the, the gender of the person involved. All right. The, the woman in, in the yellow pullover. The the Who is the head of the church, God or the government? On the one hand, you're the saying that... Well, the, there you go. The church that I go to... It's an established to, church. The it's church, an established church. The biblical definition of church, God is the head, not the government. And the problem that you're, you're having here is when the government seeks to lead the church. So, therefore, it stops following its constitution, which is the word of God, which is the Bible, and starts following the government. No. So I think that gentleman not, is correct. In a decade or so from now, in a decade or so from now, when... The touches have changed and, and um, it stops being about same-sex couples and, and maybe close relatives. We'll be here having the same debate. You cannot stretch the word of God to accommodate your own ideas. You either are for, you are against. You've said love and commitment towards a couple. What about love and commitment towards your God? If I stand and say that I love God and that I do not believe that marriage between a same-sex couple is correct, I'm called homophobic. I'm called every name under the sun. You don't tell me that I don't love or I'm committed to God, you call me a homophobic. So All what right. does that make you? You celebrate your beliefs, but I can't celebrate mine. Can I, can just I agree. Just yes. I, I think the, the, the response and the questions we've had back from the audience shows why it's so important to make sure we've got all the right uh, protection in place to make sure that churches that don't want to 
uh, do same-sex marriage, don't have to. I completely respect your views and I respect the views of the gentleman behind as well. It's one of the reasons why making sure we've got these safeguards in the bill that goes through Parliament is so important so that your church is never in the position where you're, you're being forced into doing uh, same-sex marriage in a way that you don't want but to. But it's actually being made think... illegal, isn't it, for yeah. the Church so the, of England? Church Supposing of England, a priest in the Church of England wants to marry yeah. a gay couple, well, that will be a matter. That, you're not allowed well, to. that's a debate for the Church of England to have, in the same way as this lady talks about... Excluding, you're, you're making it illegal, aren't you, if I understand we it. Could, we could make it permissive rather than if, exclusive legislation. We could allow the Church to come to its own decision. We could get the state out of these decisions um, rather than specifically exclude Excluding it, what you're but doing. why do we have a state church? Well, maybe, maybe if I can just... Well, no, just you're an Anglican. The, um, it's an established so, church. Go, yeah, all right. Let me see if I can answer Stella's point. Um, the, the reason we need to structure the, the law the way that we have is in response to making sure that Church of England and, indeed, vicars and priests in the Church of England themselves are protected from having legal cases brought against them. Uh, if the Church of England, and it's a debate for the Church of England to have, if, if they want to allow same-sex marriages, then that's a debate for them to have Justin, and no to then see that, that reflected in the bill. What we're saying is a different way in which you could do this, which would mean that you wouldn't exclude it, but you wouldn't require it. You can give them the protection without this kind of debate where people see the Church of England as wanting to exclude people and wholeheartedly. Think, and you I, would give the space for the Church so, to make that decision what in I, time rather than us in Parliament making it for them. So what to I'm clarify saying, this, Stella, is that we've to, looked at that and that didn't yeah. provide good enough safeguards for some of the concerns so, but so of course to, to, we'll have to, a debate in Parliament. So to that. protect people in the Church of England who don't want to do gay marriages you have to make it illegal for the Church of England to have gay marriages thus preventing people in the Church of England who do want to celebrate gay marriages from celebrating them. Essentially it's making sure that the you decision around well it's making sure that the decision around whether we have same-sex okay. marriages in the Church of England and Wales is a matter for that that it, church and it's <laughs> not right. for the do, we'll have do, to come do, back to do you know how many people in this country, as a po proportion of the population, are in civil partnerships? One-fifth of one percent. It is an extraordinarily small issue, affecting an extraordinarily small number of people, at the same time as we've just learnt from the census that marriage as an institution in general in this country is rapidly diminishing, and more and more people are not married for many, many reasons, mainly the result of government actions which have weakened it. Now, here we are arguing about this. What is actually going on here is, that is, is, is not a, a liberation of, of homosexuals. It's an attempt to impose on the whole of society a new bigotry under which those who happen to hold the opinion that homosexual marriage should not take place will not just be excluded from the centre of things. They will increasingly be hounded and treated as pariahs just in fact, as homosexuals were treated before the 1967 law was rightly repealed. There is an immense, furious liberal, liberal bigotry, expressed actually by Mr. Self earlier on this evening when he said... Yes, we will he said quite you. falsely. He said, <laughs> quite, he, said, he said quite falsely that people who were against homosexual marriage didn't like homosexuals. This extremely unpleasant lie is repeatedly told by those who do not wish to debate this subject and who would hound anybody who stood in their way out of it with abuse and lies. Right. And this is the problem which Sorry. our country faces. There Peter, is a new liberal Peter, victory rule which will this, not tolerate... Don't propose will to not a gay tolerate, man. Will not tolerate... <laughs> will not tolerate... Will not tolerate and, 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 and increasingly wishes to suppress Conservative Do you opinion. think we're going to be arresting you in, in toilets, Peter, and, <laughs> and subjecting you to kind of aversion electroshock therapy in order to get you right. back well, to your do you, know, do you know what, Will? I think that the, time, think the, time, the time is coming when people who have conservative Christian opinions will, in, will, no. actually, face, no. will actually face a persecution of one kind or another. It hasn't come yet. But the problem is that we have become so willing in this country, and conventional wisdom has become so willing, to accept the, the liberal majority and the ideology of equality and diversity, which is now compulsory in all public services in this country, which you have to abide by to work in the public services, all right. that the freedom to speak and think otherwise let's, is increasing. Let's move on to another yes, question. Yes, it is. Thank you, Peter. Let's move on. You, you can, of course, as you know, you can join in this debate uh, uh, through Twitter. Our hashtag is BBCQT. We've got a Twitter panellist tonight called Full Fact. Full Fact is an organisation which specialises in fact-checking claims made by politicians and the media. So the panel had better watch out. 
Perhaps we should always have fact, full fact checking yeah, what sure. they say as we go along. Um, and you can also, um, you can find them, by the way, on the BBC Extra Guest account, I think it is. Or you can text comments as you like to 83981, press the red button, you'll see what other people are saying. Let's have a question from Andrew Jardine, please. Uh, with almost three million more foreign residents since 2001, is Britain no longer British? Three million more foreign residents uh, and 13% um, of people in Britain now born outside the UK. Is Britain no longer British? Karen Billamoria. I came to this country as a 19-year-old from India to study. And this has been the most amazing country that's given me the opportunity to not only study, but to start up my business, to build a life over here. And what I've seen is the transformation of this country over the last three decades from a country with a glass ceiling, where if you're a foreigner, you couldn't get to the top. You were told you will not be allowed to get to the top, to a country where I believe now is a true meritocracy, where there's opportunity for all, regardless of race or religion or background. And I've seen this unfold in front of my eyes. I think it's the most amazing country. And I think immigration, good immigration, has been fantastic for this country. And a lot of the immigrants that have come here have done it with nothing. I mean, this year we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Uganda nations, who were thrown out by a brutal dictator, Idi Amin, 40 years ago. Look at what that community has achieved over here. But the, uh, but the question is, is Britain yep. no longer British? So, How so, would you answer that? So, and then you talk about the fact that in London now, less than 50 percent of, of Londoners are originally of, of, of ethnic origin from here. But that is wonderful. And I think it's the most cosmopolitan city in the world. And if you ask me my identity, I'm really proud to be Indian. I'm really proud to be a Zoroastrian Parsi. I'm really proud to be Asian. And most of all, I'm really, really proud to be British and what this country says. All right, well, Peter Hitchens, you were touching on this before, but what's your view? Well, immigration on this scale is unprecedented in the history of this country. There has been nothing like it. And the problem with immigration on this scale is that, of course, immigrants can come here and become British if they're given the chance to do so. If the society which welcomes them says, you're very welcome here, but what we want you to do is integrate and become part of our country. Far from doing that, it's been the policy of our governments for many years to encourage multiculturalism and the creation of solitudes in which people have nothing to do with each other uh, and, uh, and, 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 live and, and live apart. And the, there has been that, and there has also been the fact the sheer scale of this means that there are now, I think, millions of homes. I'm sure factcheck.com or whoever they are will tell us how many millions quickly, uh, where the, there are no adults who speak English. You cannot be a society in, unless everybody in that society shares certain things in common. One of them is language. One of them is law. One of them, might, you might say, would be a, a, a sense of humour. All kinds of things come together to make people what they are. We are considerably less British, and that's the idea. Because when New Labour launched this mass immigration policy, which they did as a deliberate act of policy, th th this, this is the account of, an, of a New Labour apparatchik, Andrew, Andrew Nether, who actually said that the, the policy included a driving political purpose, that mass immigration was the way that the government was going to make the UK truly multicultural, and that the, the purpose, the main purpose, was to rub the right's nose in diversity and render their arguments out of date. That has been achieved. That was a driving political purpose to change this country irreversibly and un right. out of all recognition. It's been achieved, and that lot did it. And now they're going for the, for the next election to pose as the friends of those who are worried by it, but they aren't. They're, they're, they're fat bourgeois bohemians who, in, who enjoy all the, all the, all the parts of mass, mass immigration, the cheap nannies and the cheap restaurants, which they so love. They don't care about anybody else or, or what happens to the rest of the country. Stella Creasy. Easy, easy. easy. Listen, the reason I might be fat is because I went to 80 street parties during the Jubilee in my local community. I ate hundreds of pieces of cake. My local community is exactly the sort of place that Peter is talking about that he seems a little bit frightened of. I'd love to invite you to come down and meet Walthamstow. You get a very warm welcome there because we welcome people in Walthamstow. That's what Walthamstow originally meant That's in the Doomsday Book. so kind of you. We had... Well, <laughs> well, Peter, this is the thing, you see. Britishness for I, me I, is I about a series of values. I can travel around my country quite freely, thanks, without being... No, no, no. I'm, I'm offering to welcome you to a place to come and see the kinds of things that we're talking about 
this evening because we have a very diverse community in Walthamstow. Don't get me wrong, we have challenges that we have to face, but we also have a strength that comes from that diversity because the same people who are organising all those fantastic street parties were also out there cheering on people like Mo Farah, who saw, they saw as a classic example of what Britishness could and, stood, and stands for. What do you and mean, what does it stand for for you? Because that was the question. Is well, Britain no longer British? What does British mean to you? I look at Mo Farah and he makes me proud because he's a man who worked really, really hard yeah, you're taking to rise example. to attention. Well, because British then he embodies, he embodies that sense of fair play, of hard work, of tolerance and commitment to each other. And that's what we saw during the Olympics. That's what we deal with every single day in Walthamstow. Because people who come from many different backgrounds share a shared concern. And PC would love them because they all get angry as soon as you talk about having a controlled parking zone. So there's plenty of things that people can find to find I, in common. Wherever they come from. <laughs> all right. Uh, the person asked the question, the back there, yes. I don't think you can define Britishness because it means different things to different people. I think immigration is a fantastic thing and enriches the fabric of this society. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think we have had huge uncontrolled mass immigration over the last decade and I think the census really showed just how big it's been. Pretty much a city the size of Birmingham um, in terms of uh, the, the extra population that came in. Nevertheless, I, I think, you know, you look at the Olympics, I'm a London MP, the volunteers were from the whole of London, they were fantastic. That is London today, and actually this is Britain today. Mm. And I think the key to success is making the best of the people that we've got and making the most of the fact that, yes, we are a diverse uh, nation, we are diverse communities, mine certainly is, and I think we've got to make that our asset um, in the future. And I think that we can have a big debate about whether Labour's policy on immigration was good or bad. I happen to think it was bad. I think it was bad to just allow uncontrolled numbers of people to come into the country without having a strategy for how public services would cope with them, how housing would cope with them. But the bottom line is, we are Britain today, and I think we've got to make the best of that. And I think, as the gentleman said, it means different things to different people, but I think there are some core values there of fair play, of creativity, of a fantastic sense of humour, of competitiveness, of being entrepreneurs. And I think we've been at our best when we've been not just strong at home, but when we've been out there helping to shape the world around us too. And I think that's what we need to continue doing as well, why, but why, sorry, why then, why does your government have this immigration cap? I mean, to have a crude instrument like a cap, when you, you just implement that, you're deterring the good immigration, the people who are coming into this country that have enriched this country, as the gentleman there said, with an immigration cap, you're turning people away. Well, well, Look at the way with students, with the UK border agency. The UK border agency, if I challenge them, they wouldn't even be able to tell you how many illegal immigrants are on this country, rounded up to 100,000. And yet London Metropolitan University, in one swoop, they tell the 2,500 foreign students that are there, go and find another place actually, within 60 um, days. Well, Is can, that a fair way maybe, of dealing with um, people? I can maybe... <laughs> The, me no, no, but just the, message, the message that sends out to the rest of the world is Britain doesn't want foreign students. And if you come to this country, you don't know if you're going to finish your studies you know or not. That's is that right? absolutely not the case. There is no limit on the numbers of students that come, can come to the UK if they have English, if they've got the funds for their course, and if they're signed up to a proper degree. So... Really, that is simply not. So why do you the why do you include why do you include Let student numbers and immigration numbers? Right. Why do you include yeah. student numbers? You have, you have to have. I mean, I think it's common sense to the... have some kind yeah, of a, yeah. a cap on migration. Right. I think most people in Britain would recognise. Let me bring in the man who has been none. sitting patiently with his hand in the air there. And probably... <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Um, yes. Isn't the problem not necessarily the people we have coming into this country who want to be British? Uh, but more so the people that are already born in this country who decide that actually they're not British, but they're just English. I'm very fortunate because I have a grandmother who is Scottish and a great-grandmother who is Welsh, and I was born here in Bristol. So I consider myself to be fundamentally British, except for the Irish, but we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps soon. But the problem is that we have people now who fundamentally just say that they're English. Who, who are these people you're thinking of? Well, I have many friends who just say, oh, I'm English, and you see in Scotland you want Alex Salmond having... Mm. Alex, Salmond, Alex Salmond having an independent Scotland, so I think it's not necessarily... You'd like people to feel British, not I think English, Britishness is an Welsh. important thing, because... Right. Well, you should be Welsh right. and British. All oh, right, OK. <laughs> All right. And, and you, sir, in the front row here. Um, I, I believe that... The people in Britain is what makes Britain Britain. I mean, you've got all these diverse communities, 
uh, well, there's loads of them around Britain, and all coming together to be British is what makes Britain Britain. I mean, if you think about it, um, it's like, for example, my, my granddad, he, he, um, he's Hungarian, and back in the day, I'm not sure how many years ago, but he ran his own hot dog stand in um, Bristol, and he is, he, he is part of British. Okay. He's like kind of putting British um, history all right. In well, a set of views, that's what we can't kind of make it coming from. That's 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 well made. Uh, Will self, almost three million more foreign residents since two thousand and one. Uh, was the question, is Britain no longer British? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I mean, people have said many, Britain has many different meanings to different people. I think really up to the Suez crisis in, in 1952, the court, sorry, 56? No. 56. 56, up to 56. Uh, we, of course you do, you probably were in Taking the front line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the on-the-spot fact-checking, Peter. I think more or less up to that green. point, most people's conception of what being British involved was basically going overseas and subjugating black and brown people and taking their stuff and the fruits of their labours. That was a core part of British identity, was the British Empire. Now, various members of the political class have tried to revive that idea quite recently without much success. So if we're talking about what an integral conception of Britishness is, it's actually quite antithetical to the idea of a multicultural nation. Uh, it's in favour of a multicultural empire, which is quite a different thing. And addressing the young man there who's concerned about our relationship with... Uh, Scotland and uh, Wales and Ireland, who were often employed as the shock troops of the British Empire to go in and appropriate this stuff. So if your idea of Britain is the British Empire, then this is no longer that, quite clearly. Uh, that's, that's my answer. And, and the question. scale of immigration revealed by the census over well, the I think last it's ten years. Like, weirdly enough, I think it's a bit like the issue of gay marriage, in that the people who line up on the opposition to immigration, the line of the argument, are usually racists. See, here you know, goes. You know, here, they here, are. Here, 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 here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Here goes. Particularly with the, black and brown in, skins. In, that's in, normally the case. The in, no, no, you've, the you've had your crack, Peter. The biggest in defamation of an opposite opinion. Yes, Rather we'll than a willingness soon, to listen to it. We'll or soon be invading Hitchin. Liberal, liberal, liberal bigotry is the worst of all because it thinks it's so enlightened. The, the man up there... The, it, I'm just making a point, no, you're, all right. not you're a point of you're fact. Telling it can probably, truth, well, it probably be yeah. fact we've, check. We've been round this Nothing ground. To do with we've been round this ground, I feel. Bigotry. Yes, you said... I, I think it's, I think it's easy to complain about the, the level of, uh, of immigration, but I'd agree with the gentleman in the front row that I think it's part of our, of our island cu culture. And I wonder if we'd ever built the motorway network without the help of the Irish or won the Battle of Britain without the help of the Polish airmen. OK. Let's move on. Sue Taylor, please. Is it fair to vilify the two Australian DJs for the unintended tragic consequences of their hoax phone call? All right, let's just uh, deal with it. Is it fair to vilify the two Australian DJs for their hoax phone call and the consequences of it? Justin Greening. I think what they did was hugely ir irresponsible. Um, I think having said that, that nobody really could have predicted what tragic outcome would have resulted from their prank. Um, and I think the reality, it was an Australian talk show and radio show. If, if it hadn't been reported so widely over in the UK, um, I don't know whether the nurse would have been quite so aware <laughs> of the story itself. But I think it's, it's incredibly tragic. I, I think everybody involved is obviously gutted. Um, and I think really the most important thing right now is that her family is allowed some privacy, frankly, to get on with what has been a, a huge personal tragedy for them. And I think the media circus around it really needs to stop now and, and we need to allow them to come to terms with what has happened, which has been absolutely horrible. Stella Creasy. Um, I'm really sorry, but I feel so uncomfortable about having this as a conversation because all I think of is that there's a family that's lost its mum 10 days or so before Christmas. The last thing they need is us speculating about what happened or talking about it on public TV. I'm, so, I'm really sorry, David, but I just feel if we really believe, as Justine says, that they need some privacy, then actually they need people not to be speculating about this stuff in public. I, I don't want to talk about it. I'm sorry. I feel so sorry. Yes. 
I believe there's probably more than one cause of this suicide, and, and this will come out eventually. Um, I think the uh, part that uh, the Samaritans have to play in preventing um, suicide is, is needs greater um, but, yeah, publicity. Not, just to but, clarify, um, the question Sue Taylor asked is not about uh, Jacintha Saldana. It's about the attack on the two DJs for what yes, began as a prank. That. That's, well, yeah. well, that, that's the point. I think where, where it went wrong, it wasn't in actually sort of making the phone call, but uh, subsequently... Um, uh, the uh, the DJ said that they handed the tapes on and they were checked. I think that at uh, that point uh, it shouldn't have gone any further. Once um, uh, you know they they said that lawyers had been involved in that. However, the station continued to put the uh, tapes out and, and replay the conversation over and over again. And that must have been just blatant commercialism, okay. bringing in the Australian pounds. Will, Will Self. Yes, I, mean, I was walking down Horse Free Road this morning past the coroner's court and the, uh, there were about maybe as many as 100 members of the media outside the coroner's court waiting for what everybody knew would not be substantive information. And this is just part of a kind of wider media feeding frenzy that exists. And what is the cynosia? What is the actual centre of this media feeding frenzy? Uh, a young woman's pregnancy, actually. And why is this young woman's pregnancy of such vital and all-consuming interest that these media organisations are in, uh, hungry for it, people are hungry for it? Because it's all about the succession of the British monarchy. That's the really, really important thing about this young woman's pregnancy. If you take the royal element out of this, there is no story there whatsoever. Uh, so just another good reason for a republic, I think. It's not just another uh, symptomatic of how ridiculing television has become. Um, you know, you look at uh, television, trash television, how ridiculing it is. I mean, the hoax phone call surely is symptomatic of that. Karen Billamoria. What really, really gets me about this is that this prank... And, you know, pranks have always taken place and pranks will always take place. If there are no pranks, it's a very boring world. But you don't play a prank on a hospital. You don't call a hospital... <laughs> where where you're, you're dealing with people's lives and then you try and get information about people in a hospital, which is really private information. It doesn't matter Wait that it may be the future Queen of England. Anyone's information that you're trying to get from a hospital through a prank is not on. And I don't think they should have done it at all. And the station is a lot to blame as well for condoning it and allowing it to happen. And I think real lessons need to be learned from this. OK. The, the woman in white there, you know. Woman in white. Look, B, um, it's easy to say that it's the media's fault, but in fact there's a lot of hypocrisy around. I think probably when um, we first heard that the call had been made, people thought it was quite funny and it wasn't until it had its tragic ending that we all realised that uh, it wasn't quite so amusing after all. So it's not just in the media, we all have to look at ourselves. Okay. And you, sir, behind. Um, being Australian, I um, feel quite responsible, even though it wasn't me. But I think if it could get back to them, I'd like to apologise on behalf of Australia that that's happened because I think it's hugely sad that. and devastating. But I think also Australians are always looking for a bit of fun. They're always looking for a joke, and that might be good, that might be bad. But uh, I think it's very, very sad to that this is blown out of proportion. Australians are always... We're always trying to make light of situations, have fun, and maybe we made a mistake on it, and some of those, those uh, the people on the... The station made a mistake, but I, I don't think you can put sole blame on them for this at all. Okay. And so I think it's important, being Australian, that um, they would be very, very, very gut gutted and disappointed that this came across like this. Okay. So. Peter Hitchens. Well, if I may answer the original question, no. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go on to another question. Uh, Dennis Detheridge, please. Dennis Detheridge. Should the use of illegal drugs be decriminalised? Should the use of illegal drugs be decriminalised? This is in the light of uh, Keith Vaz, the, uh, who runs the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, suggesting that the government sets up a royal commission now to look at drugs. We've been through this endlessly uh, about drugs one way or another, but he now wants a full royal commission to look at drugs in light of various uh, arguments that have been put. Um, so the question is, should the use of illegal drugs be decriminalised? 
Justin Greening. Uh, no, in a, in a nutshell. Actually, the, the level of drug usage is now at an all-time low. Uh, we're starting to see many of the programmes of all treatment. It is, actually, yeah. And well, we're starting to see many of the treatment programmes... 1630. <laughs> well, it's moving in the right direction is the point that I'm making. And we're starting to see a lot of the treatment programmes uh, getting much better rates of getting people off drugs. And I think we should stick with this strategy. And personally, I think it would send out a really bad signal to start legalising drugs, which I believe often see people end up on a rocky road to a situation where they... Do you think the Home Affairs Select stuff? Committee actually wants all drugs made legal? Is that what's behind this call for a Royal Commission? I think, as you said, you know, we've looked at this endlessly, and I think the idea that we should then kick off another commission to look at this, I think we know what the issues are. I think it's a, a question of politics, really, and what people think is the right approach to them. My personal view is I don't think we should decriminalise drugs. I think it sends out completely the wrong these, message. Who are these MPs? It's a cross-party, isn't it? Who've decided all, all the select committees? Yes. Yeah. I don't think you know Phil anything Colin. about it much, Justine. I get that strong feeling that you actually know nothing at all about it. Well, you mm. may, your alternative you may just have a different view to me. Well, how Why many, how many registered addicts were there in Britain, for example, in 1965, do you think? I wasn't alive in 1965, Will. Right. So. Thank you. I rest my All case. right, Will, you are obviously... <laughs> you know all about this, so you better answer the question. Well, there were, Remember that fact-check... There were a few you. hundred registered addicts in, in the mid-60s, and now there are many, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom are in receipt of the heroin substitute methadone. Uh, my own drug history, which includes a long, long period of addiction, is well known publicly, and I don't really want to speak from that position. Uh, but what I do know about the situation with drugs in this country is that quite clearly uh, the system of prohibition, if that's what it is that we have in place, doesn't work. It's a law that is widely flouted. Statistically, there will be people in this audience who are users of illegal drugs, and most of them will be non-problematic users of illegal drugs. You know, the number of people who are, who are addicts as against uh, occasional social users is a significant proportion, but by no means the majority. Far from what Justine's saying, the systems of treatment that are in place for people who do have a problematic, if not pathological, problem with drugs are incredibly poor in this country for a whole variety of reasons. Perhaps as many as 70% of the people in our prisons have a drink or a drug problem. Uh, treatment is painfully inadequate in prisons at the moment. Uh, and uh, really, the government should be doing much more about it. There is some but willingness, that's not an interestingly... That's legalising it, though, is it? That's uh, an argument... I can make, you can make that argument to say treatment should get better, and I think you're absolutely right, we need to keep improving treatment, but that's not an argument for legalising. The relationship of a society... Really anything about no, hold on a minute, Peter. No, 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 you've had a no, very no, long, no, 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 long, no, no, long no. go. I, it, it's, uh, I think it's time it's somebody else a, said, said something intelligent. The, the it's the not point, a bicycle. The point, the point is, and that here are some facts, and factcheck.com fact 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 can work on these as much as it likes. <laughs> we have decriminalised drugs in this country. It, it, if, you, if you're caught in possession, if the police can even be bothered with somebody caught in possession of cannabis, the most likely treatment is something called a cannabis warning which was invented by the police without even asking Parliament, which means you are let off. In 1973, the Lord Chancellor, that well-known Trotskyist revolutionary, Lord Hailsham, instructed magistrates to stop sending people to prison for being in possession of cannabis. So why... Uh, Peter, why Peter, if you... If you, if you, Peter, listen, if it's, you, if it's all legalised, why do they want a Royal Commission? Well, they want a Royal Commission because, because, uh, because there is a very, very powerful and well-financed international campaign actually to legalise drugs so that, so that various wicked people can make very large sums of money out of selling them to, to, to the population. How many people... Advertising them, marketing them through... through Legalisation no, is the essential previous... One, one at a time, there is no There, there just, is just, no such thing as prohibition. That is the most ab abject lie, which is so constantly told how many by the pro-legalisation... Factcheck.com, I hope you're on your buzzer. Uh, how many people in this country do you think at this moment are in possession of illegal drugs? Right. I have no idea. How would you have I know? no idea. How would I know? What I do know is that... But there are statistics in, in for it. Are you going to put them all in prison? Then you, you tell us. No, I won't oh, put I them would, all in prison. If think, you know, you say. Uh, no, I would certainly Don't think it's in that. excess of a million people. So but, you're going to have to build a but, lot of but, prisons so, if you want no, to... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Who's, 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 who, said, who's, who said anything which enabled you to say that? If the point of having... <laughs> the point of having a, a, a proper criminal law which is, which is prosecuted and used is not to put people in prison, but to deter people from committing stupid crimes. That's why... 
why we have laws against drunken driving. Not to put drunken drivers in prison, but to stop people driving while right. drunk. Let's break away from this uh, so debate simple. here, here yeah, at the panel for a moment and go to a member of our audience. Almost. You, sir, over there. Is, isn't it time we, we sort of had a, a real conversation, as it were, about alternatives to uh, criminalising drug users and, and perhaps looking more at perhaps the, the, the Portuguese method where uh, users are offered, um, you know, rehabilitation access to... Uh, you know, to, to medical advice and, and, and treatment, as opposed to sort of sending them down the criminal justice route, putting more uh, burden on, on the criminal justice system, and, and you know, essentially, you know, as some of the panelists said tonight, creating a sort of perpetual problem, as it were. We do that already. That's Stella, what we Stella do. Creasy. That's what we've been doing Stella for 40 Creasy. years. Thank you, Peter Hitch. No, no, I'm Stella sorry. So, in, until no. this point, so you can't have an intelligent discussion about it. I know, but we can't have a one-man discussion. No, no, it's not no. A no I, 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 I stay, I stay out of the last one, but on this one, I, no, I, I really do think that people need to deal with some facts. Stella Creasy. Instead of Stella propaganda. Uh, finished? Stella Creasy. Finished? Just well, checking. For the moment. OK. Um, actually, the experience in Portugal has been pretty mixed, but I think that's why this was quite an important report. We need to be clear, this report didn't call for legalisation or decriminalisation. What it called for was the kind of debate. I think, Justin, look, we, we may know some of the issues. We may know some of the answers about what treatment does or doesn't work. But what the report highlighted was that the two aren't going together, and that's why they talked about having a, a royal commission. We spend £15 billion trying to deal with the consequences of substance abuse within our healthcare, within our criminal justice system. So I certainly think there is room to look at what else might make a difference. How do we join services together to make this not just an issue about uh, the penal system, but actually about how you treat people, how you deal with addiction, because actually the consequences of not doing something about it are very great for our society. And I just thought it was a shame that the government dismissed out of hand what was a very reasoned piece of uh, research, a very reasoned argument about, look, actually, this is a decision that needs to happen not just by 650 people in Parliament, but does need a broader debate with perhaps even Mr Self and Mr Hitchens taking part in that debate at the same time if they'd let each other. Pity the poor chairman. Yes. Uh, the man there in spectacles. You say yes. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really good idea to have a, a look at this. We've had 40 or 50 years of this so-called war on drugs mm. and all it's done is make the people who grow drugs and smuggle drugs and sell drugs rich and it's caused huge amounts of harm to society. People whose homes are broken into, people who are robbed. Yeah. And it, it, it has achieved nothing. We okay. need to, to step away from this, not look at it as making all drugs legal and a free-for-all for people to sell them, but a sensible policy yeah. that says if you're addicted to heroin or crack or something, well, let's try doing a deal with you. Yeah. If you behave yourself, we'll give you your happy powder and we'll stop the drug dealers making a fortune out of it. But that's what we can carry. Peter, you right, really okay. must, no, must right, not I'm, just I'm try and take a chill pill. Pill. Karen, <laughs> so important. Karen, it may be important, it is important, but it's also important to hear what Karen Billamoria says. What, what is real is that in countries like Holland, in certain states in the United States where they've tried to liberalise the, the usage of, of drugs, it hasn't necessarily worked that well. And I think the real problem for me, my biggest fear, is, is my children um, getting into drugs, getting addicted to drugs. And what I try to do is, is educate them and say, don't do it, it's not good for you. You can get addicted. Not everyone gets addicted, you're absolutely right, but you can yeah, stay with them. My, so my much biggest more... fear is that my children become alcoholics, yes, but yes, you got yes. a peerage for flogging beer. Yeah, but... <laughs> Karen Billamoria. For selling fantastic beer. It's fantastic yeah. beer. And we always mm. encourage right, responsible back, drinking. Back to the point. So back, back, to the, back, <laughs> back to the point is that I think it's not about, we talk about the treatment, it's about prevention. How can we educate particularly our youngsters to stay away from drugs? And I think uh, decriminalizing them is not the answer. It's not as simple as that. OK, I'm going to move on to another question. We've got seven minutes or so left. And it's one from Lizzie Morell, please. Do you believe that the Housing Minister was right to adv advise against giving food or money to homeless people? This was Mark Prisk uh, on Tuesday saying, don't give money to the homeless, Christmas coming up, don't give money to the homeless, give them a telephone number for a new charity um, and other people will look after them. Uh, Stella Creasy. Uh, I... <laughs> 
When we're seeing the levels of debt, the levels of, of personal deprivation that's happening in our communities, uh, it's not a surprise to me that we're seeing more and more people sleeping rough. It's not a surprise. I mean, it's a fear for me. I spent two and a half years campaigning about legal loan sharking in this country, trying to get this government to do something about those companies charging thousands and thousands of percent of interest rate for loans, because I could see the choices that people in my community had to deal with the cost of living that they were dealing with now. So it's no surprise to me that some of those people have ended up on the street. And that as a basic point for us as a society, about how we help and support those people. I work with my local night shelter because fundamentally I feel compassionate towards those people that we've got to get them off the street, we've got to get a warm meal in them and get them ahead. It's why I'm so worried that this government just doesn't take the cost of living seriously because of the consequences we're seeing as a result. And when you think that your energy bills are going to go up next year, that your housing costs, you know, my part of London, it's predicted that rents are going to go up by 25% over the next couple of years. You're um, veering off the subject well, here. Because, it, the because question it's about is, how we deal with homelessness, isn't the it? And actually homelessness housing... is a function. Well, uh, can, I quote you what, with people's families. can I quote you what the housing minister said, mm. and will you say whether you agree or disagree with it? Most people know that giving money or food won't help a rough sleeper find a home, get the health care they need, or simply put them in touch with support available. Do you think that giving money or food doesn't help? I don't think it's an either or. I work with my local night shelter. I give them food. I help fundraise for them because we need them because of the consequences of what we're seeing right now in our streets and our communities. I wish it wasn't the case. And certainly I'll be fighting for policies that mean that we don't end up with people living on the street. We don't end up living with people with the level of debt they have now, which means that they have to make those kind of choices. Justin Green. I don't think anybody wants to see um, homelessness, and I think what Mark Priss was quite rightly saying is what we need to do when we see people is make sure they get help. Um, I think perpetuating their circumstances doesn't do them any good at all, and I think what he was trying to do, which I think he did very well, because obviously we're talking about it now, is highlight that there is far more support there for homeless people and that actually what we all should be doing is trying to make sure that when we see people like that, that we help them to get that support that's there. You say in the front row, and the two, I'll go, look, there are three of you, you've spoken already, but you two. You on the left first, and then you. Um, yeah, my view is, um, obviously, since I've been here in uh, Bristol as a student, um, I've been out in the town um, sometimes quite late, and I've seen people that need or, after, uh, or ask for money or food. Um, personally, I believe that to an extent it doesn't really do much um, for them. Um, but it just shows that you, there's a level of compassion, that, there's a, that there are people that actually walk past them in the street and actually do care. But um, in terms of a long-term um, effect, it doesn't really do much. Maybe there is something that could be put into place to support them or, as I said, giving them a number or some, something just to show that that will have a long-lasting effect rather than just uh, feeding right. their, their bellies just for, for, just for the, the day, man, literally. And the man next to you? Why doesn't the housing minister just arrange for more houses to be built for homeless people to, <laughs> to actually live in? That's exactly what we're doing. Well, it's not what we're doing. Right? That's precisely what we're doing. We, we're, local authorities are releasing public land so that we can get houses built. The mayor in London um, is getting more houses built. We are starting from a position of record low housing starts since the 1920s but we're trying to improve that. And we've got a whole range of policies, not just to get houses built, but to help young people in particular be able to afford to buy them. But in, the housing in... cap on, uh, on housing benefit, as I think Stella was saying, is uh, already showing signs of people being thrown out by landlords onto the street. Well, I think, I think we all recognise that the welfare system had got totally out of whack. And that wasn't we need the question to... I asked you. Is it well, I think, think what we're saying is... There are families in Walthamstow who are going to have their housing benefit capped next year. There is no spare housing. What do you think they're going to do? They're either going to be homeless or they're going to end up at the legal loan sharks, neither of which is a good outcome. Right. I think... I think we'll all end up paying the cost if these families get... First of all, we're saying that the sorts of housing benefit that we were seeing in some parts of, particularly London, of tens... Well, I've not actually answered the question that was put. You don't know what I was about to say. You talk about levels of housing benefit that people were claiming in London. You know, there were a handful of families that were getting more than £50,000 housing benefit a year, and that's... You've just concentrated the on... And that's what I mean about, especially is in your 20, is about the 24,000. I think what we're saying is that people... Um, in people who are, who are in the public sector needing uh, supported housing should sort of say, face the same choices as people who are in the private right, sector no, having to, right, we don't want to, go into to, having to get housing the, solutions right, that they can afford. We were talking about the same thing. Wait, wait, wait. We were talking about the spillage 
from this, the immediate spillage which has been reported. Peter Hitchens, what is your view about what the House Minister said? Well, my view is give what you can to a good, effective charity that will help these people out of the problems into which they've fallen. And each time you may, and from, out of the softness of your heart, you may want to give people money because people do. They see someone sitting in the street and they think, well, that person, I, I ought to give them something. So they will. it may not do any good. I don't necessarily think it'll do any harm, but it does much more good if rather than do that each time you say, you put aside the money you would have given them and give it to one of those charities. There are plenty of them. They're easy to find. At this time of year especially, put money into them and it'll do some good, more good than any politician will ever do you, that's for certain. You, well, I help run a food bank, Peter, and we've now got 100,000 of these but, in Britain. I'm ashamed that we're living a in a country being when you're doing where that, food banks have had right. to come back because so people are so worried. Amanda Boucher, yes. Sure, surely homelessness is actually a really complex problem, yeah. and just simply giving someone food and drink is not actually going to really deal with the problem. It, it, it requires agencies to work together, um, and it requires a joined-up thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that's probably not the case at the moment. And okay. it requires a government not pushing right. people into destitution. Will Self. Well, I mean, you know, charity is a kind of a sop that flows into societies as they become more and more inegalitarian. You look at our society over the past 30 or 40 years, the gulf between the very richest and the poorest has increased. And we have more and more red nose days and telethons in order to make us feel better about the fact that people are living in poverty. And so what Peter suggests is really just another sticking plaster for that. What we require is a society in which there isn't this savage declivity between the very wealthy and people, people, people sitting in the street. The woman over there on the right. The woman on the right. Oh, yeah. But Peter said, why do we have to rely on charities to help yeah. help the homeless? Why, why at Christmas does um, a, an individual who wants a hot meal and some shelter have to go to a crisis shelter? Why is it all charitable giving and not actually from, from central government? Yeah. Yeah. Charities Bilimoria. are better at it than Karen government. Bilimoria. is why charities are this, better at it. This, the point that you've just made, we in this country are less than 1% of the population of the world, and we're still, without the empire, one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world in absolute terms. It's phenomenal. Our welfare state, 200 billion pounds into welfare and pensions, and, there, and still you have homeless people, and still you have poverty, and you have child poverty in this country. And what I think is amazing, nothing is perfect. Government tries its best, it does, it's not always perfect. But what I love about this country is the charitable spirit, the number of charities that they are that will fill that gap with the armed forces charities that I've worked with, there's so many of the homeless who are former soldiers. And there's no reason logically for them to be there, but they're there because it's a very complex situation. And we are so lucky that we have a country with the spirit of giving and all the amazing charities right. that fill that gap. Thank you. Well, as always, on Question Time, a variety of opinions in which I'd like to explore more, but I can't, so time's up. Uh, this is the last programme of the year. We come back on the 10th of January. We're going to be in Lewisham in South London then. We're going to be in Lincoln on the 17th of January. So if you'd like to come on the 10th to Lewisham, on the 17th to Lincoln, apply on our website. The address is there on the screen or call that number 0330 123 99 88. It would be very good to see you. It just leaves me to thank our panel here and all of you who came to the City Academy here in Bristol, the first City Academy set up in Britain under the Labour government. Uh, from all